Okay, um, I'm going to sort of ha have an unashamedly European focus to this talk. Um, I'm also going to take a slightly devil's advocate position by asking, will the organisms we're trying to protect still be there in 10 years' time? Or, oh, sorry, 100 years' time. Um, this is being produced by myself and some of my, my students, so particularly Miranda Jones at the University of East Anglia. We'll start with a, a plot, really. What this shows is, is temperature records all around the North Sea. Uh, the, the, the pink one at the top is Dover. The, the blue one at the bottom is up in Norway. And you can just about see across all of those, there is an upward shift over the last 100 or so years. Um, the North Sea and the areas around the UK have been described as a, a hot spot, if you like, of climate change. Um, you can see that there have been ups and downs. We've had cool periods. We've had warm periods. But the overall trend has been upwards. Um, and one suggestion is that, that the temperature has risen by about six times the global average in this area compared to the rest of the world. So things are definitely changing. Whether or not you believe it's due to humans doesn't really matter, but things are definitely changing. And what I'm going to talk about is how fish and animals respond to these sorts of changes. Temperature, along with, with many other factors, including food availability, are known to impact fish particularly. I quite like this plot because what it shows is um, it's basically thermal preference on, on the sort of left-hand axis and temperature on the bottom. And you can see that different fish species have different thermal preferences. So place kind of perform best at about 15 degrees-ish. Flounder about the same. Cod prefer slightly cooler. Sea bass prefer slightly warmer. And just on this basis, you can start to make predictions about who's going to go where as the temperatures start to warm up. There's been quite a few papers talking about shifts in fish distribution patterns. Uh, one of the most widely cited was by Perry et al. in Science in 2005. And this showed that the both exploited and non-exploited fish populations have both changed their distributions over the last 25 or so years by distances ranging from between 48 and 400 kilometers. Or I don't know what that is in miles. I think in metric, sorry. Um, these authors concluded that, that um, as the temperature rises, we could imp uh, see quite big impacts on commercial fisheries. Recently, um, we've done some analysis at my own institute. CFAS was established about uh, just over 100 years ago by the MBA. Um, it's in Lowestoft, and we float on a raft of paper, basically. We've got 100 years' worth of, of data. And what these little plots show uh, these are the catches reported by the fishermen of, in this case, place, by deg a degree, by a half a degree. And you can't really see the caption, but this is 1920, this is 1930s, 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. And over that 100-year period, if you can see the crosses and the circles, there has been a shift in the average distribution of the catches, the commercial catches of place in this case, you can see that place were previously distributed in the sort of south and east of the North Sea. But in recent years, there's been a movement sort of northwards and westwards. And we've done this for quite a few species. It's taken us months and months and months to digitize all this data. But cod seem to have moved northeastwards uh, towards deeper water. Place have moved northwestwards. Oddly, sole have moved south. Um, the different species have different responses. But generally, we are seeing quite significant changes in fish distribution and commercial fisheries catches on the back of this. So, so why does this matter? Um, well, one reason that we got quite interested is that there's a bit of a vogue at the moment for creating marine protected areas. We've heard a lot about this already. Um, one problem is that if you draw a line on a map and say this is a marine protected area and your species are moving, does this mean that your species are going to move outside the marine protected area over the next 20, 30, 50 years? Um, one example of this is that the place box was created under the EU common fisheries policy, specifically to, to protect juvenile place. It's the sort of orange bit on the map there. Uh, recent surveys have shown that um, the area near to the coast of the Netherlands, where juvenile or baby place used to be really abundant, is now almost completely sort of devoid of them. And they seem to have moved both northwards and westwards towards the middle of the North Sea. So that protected area now is much less effective as a management measure 
compared to what it used to be. Um, so this has set us thinking about all of these marine protected areas that we're creating under the Habitats Directive, under the Common Fisheries Policy, under the Marine Act, are they all going to be useless in, in 50 years' time? We were, we were specifically asked by JNCC here in the UK to look at some of the proposed marine protected areas under the Habitats Directive. If you can see it, basically we looked at two, so the Dogger Bank in the middle of the North Sea and the North Norfolk Sandbanks. And what these plots show is the predicted temperature change over the next 50 years, about 80 years, sorry. And the one on the left here is, is surface temperature, the one in the middle is the bottom temperature, and the one on the right is stratification change. And you can see that for these two marine protected areas, the surface waters are probably going to warm by about 3 degrees C over the next 80 or so years. Similarly, there's going to be quite big changes on the bottom temperature, particularly for the Norfolk Sunbanks marine protected area. So if you're trying to protect a particular species or suite of species, is it going to be there in, in, in this 100 years' time? Something will be there, but it might not be the same thing. The EU Habitats Directive, when you look at how it's worded, um, the sort of bit that, that, that sort of creates new marine protected areas or gets rid of them is, is Article 9. And it's actually not very flexible uh, in terms of adaptation, if you like, to climate change. There's no explicit mention that species might change their distribution over time. And the only option seems to be you can create new special areas of conservation and you can get rid of ones that aren't working, but you can't adapt them or change them. So you only have this sort of nuclear option, really. Um, this is true for quite a lot of the, the regulations that we're looking at at the moment. If you can see the map at the top, we also have a whole load of areas under the common fisheries policy that were created specifically to protect particular species. So the green one there is the place box again. The light blue is the Firth of Falls Sandhill box. The sort of purpley grape color is the mackerel box. Then there's, there's a cod box and lots of others. Um, and the table at the bottom shows the predicted temperature change over the next 100 or so years. And you can see for all of those, and for every season, we're expecting a, a two to three degrees C temperature change. And what I'm going to talk about is something called bioclimate envelope modeling. And there's various types with various names, so Maxent and Biomapper and GARP and GLMs. And they've been applied to basically everything from birds and fish to diseases to everything to try and predict where the species are going to be in a few years' time. The approach that, the approach that we've tried to do is follow pretty much what the, um, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, do is run a series of models in parallel because we know that no model is right, so you try and look for things where at least they're consistent. So we've run three models, one called Maxent, one called Aquamaps, and one developed by William Chung et al. at the uh, University of British Columbia. We've applied this to a whole load of commercial species, also uh, conservation species, and also now non-native species as well. Basically, the way that the approach works is each of these has quite a different way of characterizing how suitable the habitat is for a particular animal. But they all sort of work in a similar way. So they start with a whole load of data of where the animal's been observed. So these are just observations from databases to say, OK, the animal's been seen here. We then take data layers of temperature and salinity and ice cover and depth and all those sorts of things in a sort of a GIS type approach. That gets converted into a sort of suitability function, and then you get the prediction for the future distribution of that species, hopefully using outputs from climate models. This is just three plots, really, from the work that Miranda Jones has been doing to show that the area around the UK, we're actually going to get, some species are going to get actually quite a lot more abundant. So the top there is anchovy, the middle is John Dory, and the bottom is sea bass. And the brighter the color, the, the more positive the change. So if it's red, it's saying that there's quite a big positive change. So in the middle there, John Dory is going to become a lot more abundant around sort of Scandinavia and the north of the British Isles. And we are starting to see these animals coming through. But this tool gives us a, the opportunity to try and predict where species will be. The different columns there are the, different, the three different model types we've used. So this is quite a, a complex plot. But what this is is I'm trying to ask will place still be in the place box in 100 years' time or in 50 years' time? 
basically, the, the three chunks on, on the plot there are the three different climate models, so Aquamaps, Maxent, and this, this Chung et al. type model. Um, first column is 1985, the predictions of habitat suitability. The next one is 2050, and we've used two sets of outputs from the uh, in, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And you can see, basically, it really depends which model you believe. Um, there's a lot of variability here. You can see that, at least here, for example, uh, 1985, the area around the North Sea is pretty suitable for place. Perhaps in 2050, there will be a decline. Similarly here, it looks like there's a decline in the suitability of the North Sea, and again here. But in this model, nothing at all. So basically, there's a lot of variability. We need to start to understand the differences between the models and how you can, as the IPCC does, sort of sum up from multiple model runs. So some conclusions. Long-term shifts have been observed in the distribution of quite a lot of species, um, with most, but by no means all, moving northwards. These distribution shifts can impact the effectiveness of particularly fishery MPAs. Many existing or proposed MPAs are anticipated to witness sort of about a three degrees C temperature change over the next 80 to 100 years. Um, European legislation is not really flexible enough at the moment to allow adaptive management. Uh, as I said, for some of these MPAs that were created under the Habitats Directive, the habitat won't change, but the suite of species that exists there will. Um, is it enough to say that, okay, we'll protect the Dogger Bank, whatever species live there? Um, models can start to help project and predict future distribution patterns, um, and that an ensemble approach can give some idea of, of, of sort of robustness of the predictions. Uh, one last plug, really. Um, this is a report, uh, well, a report card that was produced by the Marine Climate Change Impacts Partnership in the UK. Um, it tries to talk about what's happening in terms of fisheries, fish, and aquaculture in response to climate change around the UK and Ireland. There's a whole stack of them just behind the stands there. And it had quite a lot of press. Uh, in May, it got picked up in most of the UK newspapers. And then last week, it was also picked up on Radio 4 on Costing the Earth and on Country File last week as well. So these topics are getting quite a lot of press at the moment, uh, particularly all these weird and wonderful creatures sort of showing up on our shores for the first time. So a few thank yous, really, uh, particularly William Chung in, in Canada um, and my colleagues in CFAS, and these are our sponsors, basically. <laughs>